So any final words that you guys want to bring up and just talk about what your vision of the future is as it relates to this market? Yeah, love sure, sure. I'd also just love to share that, um, you know, the, the recreational market is not, is entirely separate from the medical market and psychedelics. And it's something that might come online in another 10, 15 years or so. We don't, you know, the drug policy reform is definitely happening in this country. But I think one of the better ways to de-risk the research is to have a well-informed public. We have been deeply misinformed through the propaganda of the drug war about these substances and told all kinds of false stories. And so I think that there's, you know, at MAPS, that's one of our goals is educating the public. That's one of our nonprofit goals. In, um, and how to safely work with these substances. And so I think that also helps us de-risk the massive investment into research that we've made because we won't, if adverse events happen in the population, that could be bad for us. But at this point, the science is so strong that that is unlikely to, to happen. Um, and then just in terms of the vision for the future, you know, I imagine all kinds of uh, care clinics emerging in all small towns and communities across the country where people can get not only psychedelic assisted therapies and treatments, but other kinds of complementary healing modalities. We haven't really touched on what some call transformational technologies or spirit tech or wellness and meditation and all these other complementary integrative um, services and treatments that can really help a person once they've had these great, you know, some call it an awakening or epiphanies through the use of psychedelics to help them land and integrate. Integration is such an incredibly important part to these experiences. And that's another huge kind of sector of this industry that we didn't really touch on much today. But I can imagine these culturally competent, relevant healing clinics all over the country that are surveying their communities in many formats where people can come together. We're doing a group therapy uh, research right now um, out in Oregon. And so I think that there's might be applications for that as well, especially in um, the recovery community working with psychedelics. So yeah, that's, yeah, I think, that's what I hope I for. think you bring up an important point. This is a really emergence between psychiatry and psychology and health and wellness, right? So these are three separate industries that are converging into one marketplace. So that's a really interesting way of looking at it. So. Jeff, any final words in terms of what you're excited about? What's the vision of uh, the future market, let's say five years or five to 10 years from now? I think that we're looking at a vista where there are going to be new tools available to a field that has been desperately in need of those new tools. And so I'm excited that there will, there will be many different flavors. Uh, I don't think there's gonna be one treatment. I think there will be many. Uh, and I think that those, there are so many niches and ways to think about it from, again, low dose for anti-inflammatory effects to medium dose for kind of softer effects, even to the high dose for PTSD and for kind of full transformation. Um, but I think also, uh, I feel personally, uh, I'm so all in on this, uh, you know, the dedication. It's a very specific mission-driven field and the people that are in it uh, see the potential. I think, uh, you know, if you are looking at trying to do impact investing, this is a field where you will probably, you will make a big difference. Uh, a lot of companies need help uh, to get to the finish line, uh, and it will be also uh, a nice return. So I think it's a win-win at so many levels. Yeah. I think Saad has already shown that with his 400% return. So can you tell us a little bit about your final words? and sure. and, and also... Why do you think you, you got that kind of a return? I mean, just give us a, a view into, you know, the, the financial part of this as well. Well, luck and skill. Let's just say, <laughs> you know, don't know what percentage is luck, what percentage is skill. We, we, we didn't do well. But, uh, you know, um, William Blake in, in A Marriage of Heaven and, and, and Hell has a wonderful line that was um, the title of Aldous Huxley's book as well, which is that if you cleanse the doors of perception, then one would view reality for what it is, which is infinite. And I'd love to see a point in time in the future where we can talk about um, getting a reset, because that's what it, uh, many call it in the industry, where it, you, know, you inhibit the inhibitor and it allows you to solve your problem because you're looking at it from a different lens now altogether, uh, or more lenses, I should say. But that you would, you would go and, and have a reset as part of a mental hygiene, just like you go to a dentist for dental hygiene. Yeah. And there'd be no stigma associated with that. 
Yeah, right? that's right. Because the indigenous communities, and when you look back 6,000 to 8,000 years ago, these were tools that were used by nobility. They were not allowed for the common mm -hmm. hoi polloi or, or, or the common man or, or, or woman, but it was for nobility, but, and it was used for wellness. We're not, we can't, we're not having discussions about wellness yet. We're really fixated on illness, but that's the natural progression. So we're really mm -hmm. modernizing ancient wisdom, essentially, and bringing it to the forefront into our, our existing A constructs. lot of ancient wisdom is being modernized in so many different aspects, yes. Great. Evan, final words? Thank you. So to, to add on to uh, what you and Sal were just discussing, um, Dr. Albert Hoffman synthesized uh, psilocybin LSD and it's about 80 years ago. So that's when the commercial endeavor started. And we're on a pathway here that these drugs, uh, they were tested back in the 40s and 50s. Thousands of patients under similar categories we're talking about today, anxiety, depression, PTSD, uh, experienced this. And the results were indisputable, incontrovertible that um, these drugs have healing powers. However, what we're not talking about, Saad just touched on here, is that there are far more, and wellness is important too. Um, the country, it just woven into our zeitgeist is microdosing, and everybody has heard of it because it's all over the news, it's very popular. I mean, the jury's out whether it really has an efficacious response, but certainly at least having a, a grand placebo response. But these drugs are consciousness expanding, and a couple of examples, uh, we could argue whether Francis Crick really did discover the double helix, but he does take uh, responsibility for it. He, he attributes that success to uh, LSD. Fast forward just to modern times, Steve Jobs believes that he built you know, a technology giant because of his LSD experiences. So using them, and we're not there yet, but using them to improve wellness is also you know, a benefit to society. And I think what people don't realize is that some of our major institutions, pharmaceutical companies, some of our major academic um, centers are all involved in this. So um, if you can just quickly, just as we finalize this, um, talk about really quickly who's involved, which pharmaceutical companies and um, you know, which, which academic situations, and we'll, we'll end on that. Sure, well, famously, Johns Hopkins um, has been pioneering psilocybin research for many years, since 2008, I believe. Um, we now have research centers at Harvard, um, Stanford, UCLA, uh, um, UCSF, um, down in Texas, UT Austin has a psychedelic research center. Uh, we've got some other more academic places in Wisconsin, and, and who am I forgetting? I mean, there's, there's, so there's Yale, there's Harvard, they, yeah. they're all got this. Which, which pharma, which pharma companies do we like, have oh, involved? Oh, Boringer, Ingelheim, Aventis, Sanofi Aventis, Eli Lilly, uh, AstraZeneca, J&J, of course, is uh, you know, front and center. All these departments, all these big, big pharma guys have had, Otsuka, they've all had CNS departments. Yeah. They closed down the CNS departments or, or you know, put less stress on it or less focus on it because oncology was making a lot more money, yeah. right? But now this is picking up again because we are in the golden era of so It's a new category that hasn't been really um, exemplified yet. So. Yeah, and all these guys are back. They're all coming back. And Imperial I, College of London is another yeah, big one I want to mention. So I just want to take the time to thank each and every one mm -hmm. of you for helping us take a deep dive into this very quickly. And I uh, just want to, you know, if everybody can give a round of applause for the panel.